Welcome back and now for the news in detail. In Spain, the coronavirus death toll has soared past 4,000 after 655 people died within 24 hours. This is the world's second highest death toll from the disease after Italy with over 7,500 fatalities. The global death toll from the pandemic is now over 21,000 with over 471,000 infections. Spain's death toll from the coronavirus has surpassed the official figure from China, becoming the second highest in the world. Spain's rate of infection has increased by a fifth and almost 27,000 people are being treated in hospital. The US has recorded over 10,000 cases of novel coronavirus in the last 24 hours, bringing the total to over 69,000. The US Senate has passed a $2 trillion coronavirus aid bill that is the largest economic stimulus in the country's history. Meanwhile, Iran has slapped a ban on intercity travel after country announced 157 new deaths, pushing the toll to 2,234. Pakistan has reported eight deaths so far, with over 1,100 infections in the country. The World Health Organization has asked all the countries to use the second window of opportunity to suppress and stop the transmission of COVID-19. The novel coronavirus is aggressively spreading across the globe with over 170 countries reeling from the deadly pandemic. As the number of daily infections soars in thousands, healthcare systems around the world are coming under strenuous pressure. But there are countries like China and South Korea that have managed to tackle the outbreaks in their countries better than most. What can the world learn from their experience and why is it important to flatten the curve? This report has the details. Almost 2 billion people across the world have been put under a lockdown as countries learn such measures are indispensable tools against the outbreak. The World Health Organization says governments need to slow down transmission rates to reduce the load on healthcare systems. Reducing the infection rate buys doctors time and resources to better treat people and save more lives. This is what the world is now calling flattening the curve. WHO continues to call on all countries to implement a comprehensive approach with the aim of slowing down transmission and flattening the curve. This approach is saving lives and buying time for the development of vaccines and treatments. If too many people become infected at once, the healthcare system can collapse as Brazil's health minister, Luiz Mandetta, suggested earlier last week. Flattening the curve may not be the ultimate solution, but it keeps the number of patients doctors have to deal with at a given time low. China, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong and Taiwan have managed to keep the number of cases down through vigilant monitoring and early intervention. In China, one of the very successful components of their the strategy in Wuhan was going into the community door to door, looking for people with symptoms, knocking on the doors, checking the temperature, and if they have a fever, test them. And if they're symptomatic, isolate them and quarantine the family members. And that was really a very effective way to find all kinds of people with, you know, with even with mild symptoms. Whereas if they'd just been testing in the hospital, relying on people coming there, maybe with more serious symptoms, they would have only found a fraction of the infected people. And maybe at the end of the month lockdown, there'd still be people in the community with milder symptoms who would then, when the lockdown is released, who would then come out of quarantine, come out of the lockdown and begin a new cycle of transmission into the community. Religiously complying with preventive measures, such as frequently washing hands, catching coughs and sneezes in tissues and staying home make a difference. But these measures alone may not be enough as the world and individual societies need collective action to fight the spread. Governments across the world are learning the virtue of overtly inconvenient lockdowns and rapid testing like China and South Korea. The government's measures were very decisive. For example, the lockdown of Wuhan. Looking at that, we can see it was very effective. Also, the general public has a very deep understanding of the kind of impact that might result from a public health incident like this. They have experienced the prevention and control measures during SARS and the H1N1 virus, so they have an acute awareness of this.
After last month's disaster, Italy has managed to gain some measure of control over the virus by applying the same tactic of flattening the curve. The UK, Spain and Iran employed the strategy after witnessing infections spike, but they were late to enforce the key elements of lockdown and testing. Pakistan has offered to host a video conference of the Sark Health Ministers to coordinate efforts to battle the COVID-19 pandemic. Foreign Office spokesperson Aisha Faruqi says Islamabad stands firm on its commitment to the South Asian Forum. In a briefing in Islamabad, Faruqi said India must end its communications blackout and curfew in occupied Jammu and Kashmir amid the pandemic. She said the occupied territory has been reeling under Indian atrocities for 235 days. Faruqi said Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi spoke on phone with his German and French counterparts. She said Qureshi reiterated Pakistan's call to end the unilateral U.S. sanctions on Iran amid the coronavirus pandemic. The Pentagon has halted all the overseas travel for the U.S. troops for 60 days in a bid to mitigate the spread of the novel coronavirus. In a statement, Defense Secretary Mark Esper said the order applies to all the service members, Defense Department civilian personnel and their families. The statement said under some conditions, exceptions can be granted, including travel by patients and medical providers for treatment. It said troops whose temporary duty assignment ends during this period can return to their home station. Meanwhile, France says it will withdraw all of its troops from Iraq until further notice due to the COVID-19 pandemic. U.S. envoy for Afghanistan, Zalme Khalilzad, says the Taliban in Kabul have agreed to start the prisoner release from 31st of March. He said officials from both the sides held a video conference to discuss technical aspects of the exchange. Khalil Zad said the discussion is a positive development and such meetings will continue to facilitate the peace process. Earlier, Afghan National Security Council said 100 Taliban prisoners will be released on assurances they won't return to fighting. Meanwhile, President Ashraf Ghani says he has finalized a list of 20 delegates for intra-Afghan talks under the Doha peace deal. But U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says he was frustrated after a visit to Afghanistan this week. In Kabul, Pompeo failed to reach an agreement to end to a leadership feud between Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah. Israel's Supreme Court has rejected Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plea for a delay in the parliamentary speaker's elections. The top court called for the election to be held today. This comes after Netanyahu allied speaker Yuli Adelstein disobeyed its order to hold an election for the post. He resigned yesterday, accusing the court of gross and arrogant meddling in legislative affairs. The Supreme Court had ordered Adel Stein to hold a new vote, accusing him of undermining the foundations of the democratic process. The resignation of the Knesset Speaker, Yuli Adel Stein, cleared the way for the opposition to move forward with new laws in the parliament to topple Netanyahu. Yemen's Houthi rebels say they welcome the Saudi-led coalition's announcement to support a ceasefire amid the coronavirus pandemic. In a tweet, rebel leader Mohammed Ali al Houthi says they are now waiting for the truce to take effect. Earlier, the coalition said it supports the Yemeni government's decision to accept the UN's call for a ceasefire to combat COVID-19. Coalition spokesperson Colonel Turki Al Maliki said it backs the steps being taken for the confidence-building measures on the humanitarian and economic fronts. On Monday, Guterres called for an immediate global ceasefire to protect war damaged communities from the coronavirus pandemic. The U.S. has called on the Syrian government to release imprisoned civilians, including Americans, over the aggressively spreading coronavirus. The State Department says it has asked President Bashar al-Assad to protect detainees being held in overcrowded and inhumane conditions. It said prison conditions are ideal for the virus to spread rapidly, which will have a devastating impact on detainees. Earlier, a Human Rights Watch report said nearly 100,000 people are being held in Syria's prisons. It said most of them have been arbitrarily detained after taking part in protests. On Sunday, the Syrian government confirmed its first case of the novel coronavirus. 
Turkey says it has killed five militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in northern Syria. The Defense Ministry says the fighters were killed during Operation Euphrates Shield in the region. Earlier, Turkish forces also killed eight Kurdish militants in northern Iraq in retaliation to a mortar attack. The ministry said it will not stop the operations against militants in the region. Since 2016, Turkey has launched a trio of operations across its border into northern Syria. Ankara holds the fighter group responsible for the deaths of some 40,000 people in a 30-year conflict. Iraq says two rockets struck Baghdad's heavily fortified Green Zone, which houses foreign missions, including the U.S. Embassy. In a statement, the military said Kavyusha rockets fell overnight, but no casualties were reported. The statement said the rockets fell near Baghdad Operation Command. No group has yet claimed responsibility for the attack. Since late October, there have been 25 rocket attacks on the U.S. interests in Iraq. No attacks have been claimed, but Washington blames Iraq's Kataib Hezbollah militant faction for this. Five people have been killed, including District Commissioner, after an improvised explosive device exploded near the somali kenyan border. Local police say several others were wounded in the roadside blast. Police said the explosion occurred when a vehicle carrying Ras Kamboni District Commissioner Abdul Elahi Dirye hit a homemade landmine. The Somali based Al Qaeda affiliated group Al Shabaab has claimed responsibility for the incident. The group also claimed responsibility for a suicide bombing in the capital Mogadishu on Wednesday. Al Shabaab said it killed nine government soldiers and wounded more than 24 others. In Egypt, at least 16 people have been killed in a multi-car crash in the capital city of Cairo. Local media says 15 others were injured in the accident. Local media says the collision took place a few hours after Egypt implemented a nighttime curfew to contain the COVID-19 spread. It said the injured have been rushed to a hospital for the treatment. Police said an investigation is underway to determine the cause of the accident. A man charged with murdering 51 people at two mosques in New Zealand's Christchurch city a year ago has pleaded guilty. Through a video link from his prison cell, Brenton Tarrant also admitted the attempted murder of another 40 people and one terrorism charge. New Zealand is in a state of lockdown due to the coronavirus outbreak and the plea was made at a scaled-down court hearing in Christchurch High Court. No members of the public were allowed into the hearing and Tarrant and his lawyers appeared via video link. A representative of the two mosques which were attacked was allowed to attend the hearing to represent the victims and their families. Following the confession, he has been convicted of all the charges with sentencing to occur later this year. In Kosovo, Prime Minister Albin Kurti's coalition government has collapsed after losing a vote of confidence in the parliament. The vote was brought by a junior coalition partner angered by Kurti's approach to tackling the coronavirus outbreak. The government was dismissed after a dispute over whether to declare a state of emergency to combat the pandemic. Coalition partner LDK filed the motion after Kurti sacked LDK member Agim Velio as interior minister. The removal of Interior Minister followed other disagreements, notably on whether a tariff of 100% on goods produced in Balkan rival Serbia should be abolished. With 82 votes for the motion, 32 against and one abstention, I find that the Parliament has approved the motion of no confidence in the government. It's time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. The government of Bangladesh has cancelled all the activities on its independence day today as fears of the coronavirus grips the capital city of Dhaka. Streets were visibly empty while continuous announcements were broadcast over speakers telling people to stay in their homes. Local transporters complained there were not many people on the streets. They said they have not had any trips for a long time, expressing concern about the lack of income due to the current situation. Military personnel have also been activated to patrol the streets. So far, COVID-19 has infected 39 people with five deaths recorded. 
In Italy, a new study has found asymptomatic carriers of the novel coronavirus are just as contagious as infected people who show symptoms. The research was conducted in Lombardy, one of the worst affected regions in Italy. The paper was based on an analysis of 5,830 laboratory confirmed cases between 14th January and 8th of March, with half of the sub subjects under the age of 50. An earlier study in the Chinese city of Wuhan suggested about 60% of the people who contract the infection show no symptoms. Meanwhile, another study showed that 3 to 10% of the recovered patients tested positive again at a later time. Doctors from Tongji Hospital in Wuhan said they found no evidence showing recovered people could get infected again. The UK Parliament has shut down until 21st of April to combat the spread of the new coronavirus. Emergency laws to deal with the pandemic have been rushed, rushed through both, both the houses after being given royal assent earlier. The MPs voted to plan for a managed return to work on the 21st of April to deal with budget legislation. The Scottish Parliament chamber was also shut down, but lawmakers will return on 1st of April in order to consider emergency coronavirus legislation. House of Commons Speaker Sir Lindsay Hoyle said work was underway to give MPs the technology they needed to stay connected. The Cabinet is expected to continue meeting via video conferencing. Health authorities in five Arab countries have confirmed new cases of the novel coronavirus. Tunisia's health ministry said a 56-year-old man has died from the virus in the south of capital Tunis, bringing the total deaths to four. The North African country has reported a total of 173 infection cases so far. In Lebanon, the health ministry reported 29 new infections, taking the total cases to 333. Oman's health ministry said 17 new cases were reported in the country, taking the total infections to 99. Kuwait also recorded four new cases, increasing the total to 195. Palestinian health authorities also reported two new coronavirus cases, raising the total infections to 71. As lockdowns stunt economic activity worldwide, countries and global financial institutions continue taking measures to save the economy. Germany's lower house of the parliament has approved an $814 billion aid package to cushion the economy from the direct impact of the coronavirus outbreak. The debt ceiling, which is anchored in German law and limits annual government borrowing, was also suspended, allowing access to another $170 billion in 2020. Meanwhile, in addition, to an $80 billion stimulus package, South Korea's central bank decided to provide unlimited liquidity for the next three months. The U.S. Senate also approved a $2 trillion bipartisan bill aimed at helping unemployed workers and industries hurt by the pandemic. I'm proud to announce tonight not a single senator voted against this $2 trillion rescue bill to save American individuals, small businesses, large businesses, and to provide considerable funding. The World Bank and the IMF have urged official bilateral creditors to provide immediate debt relief to the world's poorest countries. They said those nations home to a quarter of the world's population will be hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. In a joint statement, the institutions called on creditors to immediately suspend debt payments from International Development Association countries. Most of the 76 countries receiving IDA support have gross national income per capita of below $1,175. The World Bank and the IMF said suspending debt payments would provide a global sense of relief for developing countries. They also urged the world's 20 largest economies to support their call for an action. In a tweet, Pakistan's State Minister of Revenue, Hamad Azza, welcomed the joint statement. And now the weather situation from around the globe.
And that's all for now for the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indistop News.